as we've done in a couple of other videos, Sean, we're going to talk about those links between physics and computing. And again, we're back to the ultimate limits of computation. And the book I have in front of me is a book that has caused a massive amount of consternation over the last few decades. It's by a guy called K. Eric Drexler. Now, the reason it's perhaps of interest to a computerphile audience is it's 1992 most outstanding computer science book. Well, what Drexler is talking about, and Drexler is a very polarizing figure, is can we do computing with individual atoms? Can we think of, instead of compiling code, could we compile matter? Or to put it in another way, though Drexler didn't put it in these terms, but could we do 3D printing with individual atoms? Could we use those as our very, you know, very smallest building block? And if we could, that's a remarkable technology. That means we, you know, because as some of the more extreme proponents of Drexler's um, vision had in mind, we could, for example, envision some technology which is effectively looks like a microwave. We'd go outside, we'd get some grass, we'd come, we'd put it into our thing that looks like a microwave oven, we'd press a button and the ding, 30 seconds later, I pops a stick. This is like replicators and stuff. Right? It's exactly like Star Trek replicators. One pan fried catfish. We talked about this on one of the previous videos that you guys have manipulated atoms and made a switch with atoms. Yes. These sorts of basic building blocks are being pushed around at the minute. They are, and th but Drexler's vision is much, much grander than that. Drexler claims that we should be able to take any s lump of matter and convert it not quite into any other lump of matter, but certainly to break those chemical bonds down and form a structure to a predefined blueprint. Importantly, he's not saying that we have to, you know, that we're going to disobey the laws of physics. He's not saying that we're operating in some strange parallel universe where the normal laws of physics don't work. But he is, for example, talking about systems like diamond. He spends a lot of time with diamond, which is a strongly bonded substance. You know, diamond is fairly hard. Tight covalent bonds holding the atoms in place. And he makes the argument that we should be able to, um, under those circumstances, if we can control the bonding on a single chemical bond by single chemical bond basis, the atoms will stay in place and we should be able to build up different structures. So he focused a lot of his time on, on, on diamond. Um, I can show you a short video, Sean. Okay, so we have this microwave object. And on the, the side here with these canisters, what we have a very simple food stock, so very simple stock that's, that's put in, so simple molecules like CO2, water, CO, methane perhaps, molecules that can be broken down into component atoms and then built up into something bigger, and just how much bigger we'll see in a second. And cooling, etc. quite how it all works, we don't know, this is science fiction, but like the best science fiction, it makes you think, is this possible? Could we manipulate matter like this? Out there in computer file land, think about this. Does this disobey any of the laws of physics? And, you know, Drexler's been widely castigated, perhaps unfairly. I think he, certainly unfairly in some cases, because these are, these are grand ideas, grand visions that are worth, worth exploring. Are we anywhere near this? No, we're nowhere near this. But you can see what's happening now as we're zooming in. And now we're down to the 10 nanometer level. So just to give you an idea, an atom's a few, there's a fraction of a, of a nanometer across, say 0.3 of a nanometer. So once we're 10 nanometers, we're talking about say 300 atoms, something like that across. So here's these molecules streaming in. So in this case, it's C2H2. And what's happening is they're being fed through, moving across. It looks very much like the type of machinery where, and mills and factories were used to in the macroscopic world, except it's all shrunk down. Each one of these single spheres is a single atom. And what's happening is you're getting atom, atom transfer, you're breaking these molecules down. You can see what's happening now, transferring them across to these tips, these probes. This is where scanning probe microscopists get, like myself, get very, very interested in that. We have a sharp probe, we bring it in close to a surface, move it back and forth. This probe is atomically sharp, so it allows us to see single atoms and single molecules and manipulate single atoms and single molecules. So some scanning probe microscopists at least look at this and think, well, parts of that we can do. The problem is very, very small parts of it we can do. Moving the video on, let's scroll through various different elements. What happens later on is we have different blocks that are transferred across different elements. Quite how any of this works, we don't know. Where does it get its energy source? We don't know. And out at the end, 
pops a laptop. The argument being that what's happened is that those very simple molecules at the start, by building them up, manipulating the very individual atoms, we've compiled matter into this final, final form. So this video, you said this is science fiction. This isn't science fiction as far as whoever's so written this. This is Drexler. Drexler believes this is, this is something that, that would be possible in the future. Um, many of us have many issues. Surfaces in particular are a particular issue in terms of it looks very simple that we'll just get some blocks and we'll snap them together. In reality, surface physics is incredible and surface chemistry is incredibly, incredibly challenging to um, surmount. But the, again, the ideas here are fascinating. It, it really is. Could we, could we do this? Even at the level of, you know, how would we get a power source here for that little sorter for the molecules? Forget about a whole laptop. Let's, let's reduce this all the way down. Can we do information processing with single atoms or single molecules? Or groups of atoms or group, groups of molecules? Can we translate all that complexity down and think can we on the basis of individual atoms and molecules do information processing and yes we've done that the nanoscience community has done that i suspect not many in computer file land are familiar with this it's a beautiful beautiful piece of work and stunningly elegant piece of work um, from uh, don Eigler's group so don's retired now but his group at ibm almaden was research labs was responsible for a lot of the pioneering um, work in nanoscience. Indeed, Eigler's group is responsible for manipulating atoms for the very first time. And what they spelt out was the IBM logo. This is beyond elegant. They've done computing, information processing, they've set up logic gates with molecules. And they've done it in a really fascinating way because they've effectively used a domino effect in terms of how molecules interact with each other to transfer information from inputs to output. And they've done it on the basis of CO, carbon monoxide, very, very small quantities. You don't have to worry about any poisoning or anything like that. Also in an ultra high vacuum, also at very, very low temperatures, four degrees above absolute zero. So it's not toxic at all. But they put them down on a copper surface. And when the CO molecules go down on the copper surface, they absorb in a number of different states. They absorb like this, where it forms this little dark patch, so the red dot represents a CO molecule. Or it forms this type of structure where the two molecules are beside each other, which is a dimer, two CO molecules together. Or it forms this structure, which is a trimer, three molecules together. How do they image this? How do they see the individual molecules? Well, it comes back to that scanning probe technology. Sharp probe, close to the surface, move back and forth. And um, if the probe is atomically sharp, you can see individual atoms and molecules. So what they do is they manipulate the CO molecules. Here's a CO molecule. So you can operate in a mode where you scan, or you operate something very straightforward. You push the probe towards the surface, and you do that. And you move it across the surface. So you can manipulate an image just by moving the height of the, the probe above the surface. So what they do is they set up these arrangements. They set up dimers. Dimer, 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 dimer. Then what they do is they bring in another molecule, this one with the green arrow, bring it close, and what that does is it triggers, see the red dots are the positions of the CO? It triggers this cascade process, whereby they all rearrange, just like a set of dominoes. They're not falling, the molecules are rearranging themselves. It's not like they're falling over, but they're rearranging themselves. Now that's clever enough. That's really clever. And although this is uh, 2002, although it's 16 years ago, it's still like, an incredible, phenomenal paper. Is that a reversible process? That no, because dom dominoes aren't easily no. reversible. Are no. They? So what what we're not talking about is so this is this is the difference between fundamental science and technological application. First of all, you know, if we were to take this type of approach, I think we're going to be hard pressed to sell it to anyone because most people are not going to want to top the computer up with liquid helium. That's the first thing. Pretty, pretty complicated and irritating to keep an ultra high vacuum going. Moreover, the bandwidth is about 0.1 or maybe 0.01 of a hertz because you have to set this entire system up and then uh, set it off. It's not reversible. There are other systems for which it is reversible, but not this. But this is, this is exploring the limits. What they do here is they develop different gates by setting up different arrangements of molecules. So here's one example of an AND gate, whereby you've got input X and input Y here. And so by, by bringing in molecules, either by um, causing a cascade here or causing a cascade here or causing a cascade at both points, then the output here will change. So basically here, if we bring 
uh, a molecule in here to set a one here, but there's a zero here, there's no molecule here, then what happens is there's no change. The I put remains. However, and similarly the opposite way. However, in this case, if you bring in a tripping molecule here and a tripping molecule here, a control molecule here, then what happens is there is a big change and you can read that as a change in the output. So what we have is a logic gate made out of molecules, which is, is and made out of this molecular cascade. Okay, it operates incredibly slowly. Okay, it's under extreme conditions, but as a piece of elegant science, it's phenomenal. Why do they need these incredibly low temperatures? Why do they need to be at four degrees above absolute zero? The problem is with this system, with molecules on metal surfaces, what happens is if you warm the temperature up even slightly by 10, 20, 30 degrees, something like that, then thermal motion kicks in and the molecule starts to wander across the surface. So these beautifully engineered structures you've made will fall apart just due to diffusion. Effectively Brownian motion. It's not quite Brownian motion, but the same type of thing. So what you need to do is find systems whereby this type of diffusion doesn't kick in. And actually, Drexler had it right. So what you need to think about is covalently bonded systems where the bonds are stronger. Instead of weak bonds between the molecules and the surface, which is actually quite good because it allows you to do this with ease, to slide things around with ease. But the problem is then in terms of trying to exploit that in any type of realizable technology, it's really difficult. So you need something where the bonds are quite strong and where you can raise the temperature without things hopping around. And there have been major efforts over the last few years to do this with um, silicon. And in fact, we're now at the point where this is Michelle Simmons' group in University of New South Wales. There are a number of groups working on this. Michelle's group in University of New South Wales, Bob Walco's group in um, University of Alberta, there's Chris, Christian Joachim, Joachim, sorry Christian, you know I always get the pronunciation wrong, um, at CNRS, who's led, Toulouse, who's led a, a big effort on this, there's Stephen Schofield's group in University College London, we've dabbled a bit as well, not quite at the level of those other groups, but we've dabbled a little bit in this, in terms of really manipulating at the single bond level. Michelle's group, however, has made that important leap whereby they've taken this type of atomic scale engineering and they made a transistor out of it. This, this paper really nails its colours to the mast, a single atom transistor. And what they do is they pattern a silicon surface. So we did a video for 60 symbols a number of years ago, which describes just how this works. But basically you take a silicon surface, you crack it open and you form two surfaces. The atoms here and the atoms here are really uncomfortable. They're no longer in their nice environment where they were bonded to the neighbours. Atoms are very gregarious, they like to bond. So when you split them open, when you split that, that crystal open to expose those surfaces, it's a very high energy state and the atoms don't like to be in that state. So what you can do is you can passivate that surface. So you can make it less reactive by adding other atoms to it so the bonds are tied up. And a really good one is hydrogen. So, you, for silicon. So you take the silicon crystal in vacuum, the surface, and you bombard it with hydrogen. And what you can do is you can sit above an individual hydrogen atom, bombard it with electrons, and remove one single hydrogen atom. So you've got one chemical bond. And again, to be fair to Drexler, this is the type of thing he was talking about quite some time ago. Then what you can do, and this is what Michelle's group has done, is that, that one dangling bond now, you've got that one bond, that's, and it's literally called a dangling bond, that's what we, we call it. So you've got this inert surface with this one dangling bond. Then what happens if you put other molecules down, in this case they've, they've put a phosphorus containing compound down, is that it will bond just at that point. And that means you can put down a single phosphorus atom at that point. And that's what they've done. And phosphorus is what's called a dopant in silicon. But basically you add impurities to control the electronic properties of silicon and that's how every single electronic device, and every single semiconductor device relies on the properties of doping. In this case, we're down to the limit of doping with a single atom. And that's what they've based this, this single atom transistor on, is they've managed to access and address that single atom to form a, a, a single atom transistor. So that, that that's, really quite phenomenal. Interesting, the one thing we were missing, okay, you could create this, this dangling bond, but really you need to be able to correct it and to reverse it, and to be able to error correct for one thing. It's taken a long time to go, it was like 90s when it was shown that you could do you, you remove the hydrogen. It's taken a long time to get enough control over the probe to be able to just connect the probe or push the probe into the surface and transfer that single hydrogen atom to heal out that defect. So here's the defect. 
that one single bond and as you can see hits functionalized tip then they bring it in and they connect with directly that 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 dangling bond so tip comes in dangling bond tip and at the end of the tip there's a single hydrogen atom and it transfers and you heal it up so we're now at the point where we can make these structures make these dangling bond features but also repair them which means that when it comes to generating logic gates in terms of making structures whereby we can have arrays of these dangling bond features that communicate with each other not in the same not quite the same as the molecular cascades but the same idea where perhaps we transfer instead of a physical transfer of molecules we have a transfer of electrons then we really are processing at the atomic limit we've got a long way to go before we get back to Drexler's nanosystems a long long way to go but then the next idea is well can we actually we've got information processing at the single atom limit we're processing matter at the single atom limit how far can we push this one three two one three there we are back up Nice. Five, one, three, three. We can make that time because by narrowing down that time, we broaden out the energy associated with the with the operation, which sets a fundamental limit. Because the narrower, 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 narrower we get that, the broader and broader.